two panelists who we have today. Um, first, we have Aaron Anderson, Director of International Recruitment, University of British Columbia. And we also have Becky Kononsky, uh, Assistant Dean of Undergraduate Admissions and Director of International Admissions, Santa Clara University. Uh, on behalf of Navigate 2020, uh, go to college fairs. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to our panelists. Thank you both for taking the time to speak today. And um, we can go ahead and begin whenever you're ready. Wonderful. Well, it's uh, great to be here. And uh, I think that uh, maybe before we share our screens and, and jump into our presentation, we can uh, take a minute to uh, introduce ourselves and get a bit of a background. Uh, it'd be great to hear from all of you, but uh, this is going to be one of those one-way presentations. We'll try to make sure that we're, we're relatively brief, uh, and then at the end, we have some time for some Q&A, and that would be a little more of an interaction. Becky, you want to share a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Aaron. Um, so again, my name is Becky Conowitz, and I work in Silicon Valley, California at Santa Clara University. Um, I serve as the Director of International Admission and Assistant Dean. I've been doing this work for 15 years and so fortunate to meet people like Aaron um, up in Canada, but also people around the world that takes me traveling to meet international students, taking care of American students abroad, but also more importantly, helping any American student understand the potential um, of including international education in their college search if they haven't already done so in high school. Um, so yeah, I'm, I feel really fortunate to have landed in this career. I was an English major and had no idea this existed. And now I get to have a passport full of friends on my LinkedIn from around the world and working with great colleagues like Aaron. My name is Aaron Anderson and I work at the University of British Columbia, which is in Vancouver and the Okanagan here on the west coast of Canada. And I too have been in this field for uh, nearly 20 years in fact. And uh, very fortunate to uh, be able to uh, meet and travel and, and, and uh, connect with students and families from all over the world. Um, education is one of the ways that we can really bring the world together. And so whether it is uh, studying in another country or connecting on your own campus with students from other perspectives and cultures, uh, it's a really, really important factor. And I'm glad that so many of you are, are here to uh, learn a little more about that. Um, as you can see from behind me, I'm, I'm bringing, I'll bring a little bit of the Canadian perspective. Uh, I, uh, I am a, uh, uh, um, uh, a father of three children and uh, as we all are, we're at home right now. Uh, so I should say that uh, both uh, Becky and I hope you are all being well to one another, uh, that you are working through these uh, uncertain times, that you're staying safe and healthy um, and you're making the most of these, uh, these different, different uh, days. So we're, we're glad part of that is being here and learning about your future. Um, so what we'll do now is we'll sort of dive into our, our, our uh, slides uh, and our information so we can have some visuals as we go. So at this point, you should all see on your screen our first introduction, introductory slide. Uh, this is gonna be about a 20 minute or so presentation. And I say we're gonna leave lots of time for presentation, or lots of time for, for Q&A uh, as we go. And Becky will, will guide us through um, uh, some of the, uh, the points that we're talking about. Perfect. So as we thought about what we could share with you all, as you think about international, what does it mean for your college search? You know, I think the one that comes to the forefront is study abroad and exchange. So we'll talk about that. We're also going to talk about the idea of studying outside your home. So if you're an American and you've gone to high school here in America, what are your options if you think about Canada, Europe, um, other places, and what would that look like? We also want to make sure we cover a little bit about academic programs, international courses, thoughts about including international in your academic and research, and then also really thinking about the international culture on a campus, whether that comes through students and clubs, um, opportunities on a campus to think about the world bigger than yourself. So um, those are kind of the talking points that we will cover is that uh, at this time uh, we maybe would do a poll and try to get a sense of uh, where is everyone joining us from in terms of their uh, academic uh, career, whether they're in grade 10 or 11, or maybe some of you are in seniors, perhaps there's college students there. Uh, uh, we can't do that. And we also recognize that with well over close to 200 people on this call right now, that there's a wide range of experiences and demographics and ability to access some of these programs. And so I see a, a couple of points already about 
you know, is this for, for studying abroad? And, and yes, it is. But Becky's also mentioned that even if you need to stay home or decide to stay and, and go to a fantastic local college, there's ways for you to have an international experience. So we're really trying to look at the full spectrum. Um, and hopefully, you'll come away with this with some tools to help you do that college search. So you can really think about ways to look at international as a component to your search, just as you would search for great uh, uh, residence life or great um, athletic programs. Perfect. So the most popular, the one I think most people sort of have questions about as they think about universities. I know it's a popular question we receive when we travel and meet students or receive emails or, or contacts is really what is your study abroad and what does that mean? So most universities um, will have a program where they can, students can leave for a semester, a quarter, a time um, to study at another university, study in another country. Some of those programs might be direct linkages. That tends to be what the word exchange means. So an exchange with a university, maybe it's um, Cambridge in London um, in, in the UK and you, you as an American student at um, a university will go study at Cambridge and then a Cambridge student might come back and study at your home at university. So it's a direct exchange, run one for one. And then study abroad tends to be thought about most universities will have many different programs and so a student might be um, able to study at a university through a third party that's hosting them. Um, but the idea is that credit is earned and credit is transferred, right? So you don't um, stop moving in your progression towards your degree and your interest while you're studying in this environment for a semester, a quarter. There are also um, maybe shorter term programs that faculty have arranged depending on, on the program. So really important to know um, with study abroad or exchange some, some things to think about. Erin, um, if you go to the next slide. Um, as you're sort of looking for programs is that they are different at every university and there's gonna be different opportunities. So what is unique? And those are great questions to ask a university. You know, how many students study abroad? What are your programs? Um, how are they constructed? Can every major, every course program have an opportunity to go? Sometimes there's limitations. Sometimes it's um, depending on the partnership that that university has. So those are great questions to ask as you're researching. If you're really keen to go to one university overseas or really keen to step foot in a certain country, that could also guide your questions. You know, it's not, um, unreasonable to ask a university, do you have a program in Antarctica? Um, many of us might be able to answer yes for that. Um, but simultaneously, if you really have a curiosity around a culture, um, we know we see students who really like Japanese anime and they really want to be immersed in Japanese culture and they want to know what programs we have and how are they designed. Those are great questions to start your college search around. Um, it's important to know not only by major and program is the length of these programs. Is it for a full semester, or a full quarter? Is it short term with a faculty one week over spring break? Could it be over the summer? Um, and so those understanding that length is, is really a personal question for you as well. Do you want to spend that much time away? What does that mean for you? And then more importantly, what are the costs? The longer the program might be more costs, but also the shorter ones, depending on where they go. Think about cost in Tokyo is gonna to be very different than a cost in Panama, um, in Panama City. So thinking about costs is important as you sort of investigate. Does the university charge a fee for you to study abroad or is it incorporated? Does your financial aid transfer with you if you spend a semester or a quarter at another institution? Is there, are there scholarships for your study abroad program? Those are all great questions to think about. But more important, you should be aware that you're gonna get different answers. It doesn't, um, it shouldn't stop you from asking the questions so you're aware. Typically, students need to start thinking about these programs to study abroad or do exchanges in their first year on a campus. Um, and so when do students typically study abroad tends to be in their second or third year because the first year is when they get exposure and they understand what a university may offer 
And so the earlier you start asking these questions in your college search, if it's an important part of your college search, the more ahead you'll be at the university you decided to roll in to start knocking on the doors of those departments or the faculty running those programs to say, I, I want to get in line, I want to do this. How does it align with my academic program in order to graduate? Um, how does it align with my career interests, with my goals, um, with my interests? And so they'll guide you on that. But typically that's happening in the first year, so you can go early. Some universities have started first year programs where students study abroad right away in their first year. So again, all things to ask about. And send it over to Erin. All right, so, uh, so so clearly study abroad is, is something that a lot of you on this call are, are interested in and, and is a component uh, when you're thinking about universities. Um, and in, when you're doing those university searches, certainly it sounds like the study abroad for some of you may be one of those things that is at the top of a list when you think about universities. And for others, you know, residence life might be uh, first and then athletics and study abroad. So individually, you just wanna do that sort of self check in terms of where something like study abroad might uh, come in when you're thinking about universities. Um, for many of you on this call, you may be so international, interested in international and, and, and studying outside of say the United States, I'm assuming many of you here are on, from the United States, that you're actually considering studying uh, your, for your complete undergraduate degree in another country. Um, and so with that, there, there are really endless global options. Uh, traditionally, students have looked to go to UK, United Kingdom, study in, in England, or to study in Europe. Um, but more and more, there's students going to Asia. There's some, some incredibly diverse, very, very strong academic universities in Asia. Uh, you may decide to go as far away as Australia. And so the, the things, the reasons to be thinking about uh, any of these options uh, would be a, a wide range, but when you're thinking about them and maybe you're having to sort of uh, appeal to your parents or, or make the case to your parents why you should be going overseas for an education. Um, there's a few things to think about and you know here we have seven or we have five, whatever it might be. I think first foremost is to reassure them that these universities that you may be looking at, um, whether it may be particularly in Europe, particularly in UK and in Canada are very high quality of education. Uh, they're often public institutions, so the government is ensuring high standards of education. You're also going to find that the cultural experience of studying in another country is really going to set you up for success uh, in, in, in a career. It's going to give you exposure to different perspectives. Um, and that's something we'll say many, many times in our, in our talk today. The other thing to be thinking about as well is the costs. Um, and we'll talk a little more about Canada in, in specifics, uh, but certainly Europe and the UK often are actually less expensive than studying in, in the United States, particularly, you know, look, depending on what range of universities you might be looking at in the US. So there could be a financial incentive for you to be studying there as well. Um, when you are thinking about options, we'll say look at the United Kingdom or Europe, it is important to do a little bit of research in terms of the different degree uh, um, out, or uh, how they're structured. And so something like the going to do study in England, they're very, very specialized right from year one. You, you really almost have to know your major right from year one, where in Canada and the United States, uh, you have a little more time to go into a broader program and then specialize in your, in your upper years. Um, and so there's little differences like that, that uh, are, are things just to be aware of. So certainly uh, there are some great resources and maybe in the Q&A we can spend a little more time looking at uh, some, some websites for you to explore, say studying in the United Kingdom, um, Europe, Netherlands right now has some very, very strong academic programs, um, Germany as well. And uh, they're all very a different college experience. You're gonna be living in very exciting cities, of course, the history of Europe, but there's also trade-offs as well to be thinking about the residence life is going to be often a little bit different than you might think of not as many traditional college campuses experiences in in Europe just because they're smaller cities frequently um, athletics might be a little bit different and so things like that may be different but of course living in Europe or, or, or living in Asia uh, for four years that in itself is such an enriching experience so uh, I will spend, uh, as a Canadian, I can't help but uh, spend a couple minutes just talking a little bit more about uh, the option to study in Canada. Uh, for those on this call who perhaps are looking for uh, the, the best of both worlds, to be able to stay close to home, relatively speaking, um, but also have that international experience, Canada is, is a fantastic option for you. So no matter where you're joining us from on this call, if you're in the United States, 
uh, likely there's a Canadian top Canadian university that's uh, a lot closer to you at home than say going to uh, Tokyo or going to uh, Paris. Um, that education is, as I mentioned before, certainly high, high level in Canada. We, in Canada, we in fact spend more money um, uh, as per capita in our education, post-secondary education, any other university, any other country in the, in the um, G8. And the great thing as well is that it's a transferable academic system. So you may decide to study abroad and go to the United States even for, for a year or go abroad, but the degree, whether you're wanting to go to medical school or law school, our students in Canada frequently go on to uh, top graduate programs and go into work back, at, back home in the United States. And in terms of work, that's something else that's a, a real advantage. When you think about Canada, um, in these turbulent times, the, the ability to have more work options is something I think we all would like. And with Canada's graduates uh, who graduate for with an undergraduate degree from a Canadian college may stay in Canada after three years, or your, your study permit your study visa translates to a work permit. So you can actually stay in Canada, take advantage of those connections. Um, and, and that's a real bonus these days. And so the other thing to think about is, is value. So we, in Canada, there's, there's only about 90 universities compared to the thousands in, 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 in the United States. Um, but uh, the value is, is very strong. And so this is an average, this is a couple years ago, but this is an average. So there's gonna find universities that are less expensive. If you look on the side here, $28,000 US, that's a mid-range university or certainly less is going to be even less than that. And there's going to be some like the University of British Columbia, which is where I work, which is going to be higher than that. Um, but all total, you, you certainly are very, very realistic to find a total academic package for one year for all costs at about $40,000 up to as high as $50,000 with a place like University of British Columbia. So things to be thinking about. And uh, as I say, Canada, you get a great international experience, stay close to home. A very much a U U.S. experience, but still being outside of the United States and a great way to see the United States um, for a few years from, from a different lens. Thanks, Aaron. So as, as we covered both study abroad and exchange and then the idea of studying away in a foreign country for your entire degree, we wanted to spend some time talking about how to internationalize your academics. And I think this is a piece as students think about um, what they want to study, how do they find out about these. You know, I started just with a simple search because obviously I know what Santa Clara offers, but I really was curious, how is this named at other universities? And this is where it's going to be a challenge for you and, and great to use your resources in the admission office. That's why admission counselors are here. So if you want to add international to your academics, I really encourage that to be a question that you ask admission counselors for each of their universities because simple things like um, naming of departments or naming of courses are going to vary. Um, so everything from conflict studies to peace resolution um, might be the same content but name two different things. The popular ones are international affairs, international business, but we really wanted to make sure that you knew a lot of times in our course majors and our programs there's an international curriculum built in or for you to concentrate in. So for example, something like education or history, if you wanted to take an international lens, certainly there's gonna be programs out there and those are great things to explore. Many of those programs will, will require an international um, study abroad experience or build it in for you or have an international internship or have one at the UN some universities have or connections um, around the world for world health organizations, right? If you want to study public health, they're going to get you into that experience. So those are the kind of ways to think about this. Yes, some of the programs are labeled with the word international, and some of them are the traditional. If you dive deeper, you'll see that they have an international lens. Um, we also wanted to talk about some of these other programs that you might not think about outside of academics, because your learning on a college campus doesn't stop in the classroom so much of what our students both at UBC and Santa Clara talk about is what they experience outside the classroom. Whether that's in the residence halls and exposure to a new lecture, a club, they're out volunteering um, with an immigrant population or a social justice issue that's going on in a community, they're really getting that exposure. So as you think about internationalizing your college experience, 
do think about these programs, um, everything from Model UN, which I know many, many applications I've read over the years um, across the world as well as across the US. Students have spent hours in their Model UN in high school, and we have that in college, right? Um, if you want exposure to any of these clubs or volunteer opportunities, three great questions, great ways to complement study abroad, complement your academics and really dive in. The other nice benefit is this is how you network and meet people. Oftentimes you have the same interests. And so as these, um, as the world gets connected um, and, and you build these relationships, oftentimes it's these clubs and volunteer opportunities on a college campus that really expand your network and open doors and think about your career and your vocation in the future. Um, and so that's, that's what happened to me. I, as I said, I was an English major. I studied abroad. Um, I was um, really interested in this work and this world, but I didn't know how to connect it all. And it was through clubs and volunteering and getting to know international students that led me on this path. So make sure you think about that, ask about that. It can really enhance your college experience. Um, Aaron's gonna talk a little bit about sort of the other parts of this college experience with our international students that are on all of our campuses around the world. Yeah, so, so kind of picking up where Becky's going with this is, is that as we mentioned off the top, uh, some of you, your, your circumstances may change and may, maybe financially it's, it's not possible for some of you to study abroad whether for the full four years or even financially to go abroad uh, during one year or our term. Um, but there's many ways to have that international experience. So as Becky was mentioning, at, whether it's a community college, whether it's your four-year college down the street, um, be looking for aspects of these clubs, these experiences, and really looking for universities, just even in the United States, that, that are very international in their outlook. Um, and so one way, if, if you are interested in, in learning where the, the most uh, widest range of study abroad options are or the widest range of academic international programs, it's, it is often the universities that have a high international student population. And those may be universities right in your backyard. Uh, it's often the case that the larger research universities have large uh, international student populations. Uh, it, it starts with the graduate level at the research level and it often trickles down to the undergraduate level. Um, so in that case, those public institutions in your states, they very likely may have large international populations. Um, and so when we talk about international students on your campus, this can very much enrich your undergraduate experience. It, it may, you may decide, you know what, I just want to focus on my studies. I want to be doing a history major. Or I want to do biology. Um, I may not end up traveling or may not study abroad, but I still want to be involved in these clubs and just have an international experience. So be thinking about that when you look at your university lists. Um, certainly, when you when you look at the data, if a university um, showcases that they have, you know, ten percent or more international students, that's that's a pretty good number. Um, and then the other thing to dig a little deeper on is the number of countries represented. Uh, often, the case they might a university might say, "Hey, I look at this, we've got fifteen percent or twenty percent international, but you know, eighteen percent of those are coming from one country." And so you should, to really find an uh, international campus, you want not only look at the percentage of international students, but the number of countries represented and maybe even the percentage within those countries. Um, so again, having that, that flavor that adds a diversity in language, adds diversity of perspective, um, and you never even have to take an international club or study abroad to get that. You're gonna get it in your biology classes, in your history classes, in your English classes, your math classes, just by being on some of these. So I was going to showcase a, a couple of lists. Uh, some people, this really helps. I know this may be small and hard for you to see, and, and it, depending on where our, our video is on your screen, you can always move our little webcam pictures, uh, I believe, on your screen to see the full list if we happen to be blocking this. Um, but there's a couple of global rankings that actually look at all the universities and compare them in terms of internationalization. And so Times Higher Education is a, is a um, periodical out of the UK that for years have ranked universities globally on a number of factors. They do one specifically on international universities. Um, and this is on the factors of, of the, the percentage of international populations. They look at the number of international programs, uh, the research that is international collaboration. And so as you see here, based on those metrics, um, it's a range of universities from a range of countries and not a many American universities here. I think there might only be uh, one uh, North American university on here. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. It's University of British Columbia. But there's also uh, several in Asia and Europe. 
So this is to give you a, sh a showcase of, of the number of global perspectives that there are. If you're interested more specifically in uh, looking at uh, specifically North America, um, here is a list of uh, the best global universities in North America, again, according to US News and World Report. Um, and you can Google some of this if you're interested. Uh, some of those likely names that are there at the top, as you probably are familiar with. But you'll also, as you kind of scan down the list, you'll see, again, some of those larger research public universities. You see University of Washington pretty close to the top. Uh, uh, you see the, 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 some of the UCs there as well. Uh, University of Toronto there, another great Canadian university. So larger research universities. And you'll see the number of international students um, listed there as well. And then one other interesting list is if you look just at the sheer number of international students, this is both graduates and undergraduates, uh, going to that point of uh, just looking for a campus where you can surround yourself in perspectives and ideas. Um, this is looking at the top 10 of uh, according to Times Higher Education by, by just number of volume of students. And so a uh, place like NYU in a very international city like New York, uh, USC, very international city like Los Angeles, and these are both undergraduate and graduates, uh, you'll see. But then you have a place like Arizona State, which I know has a, has a large number of students from all over the world. Uh, University of Illinois, UCLA, Michigan, University of Washington. So this is where you're getting a chance to, in your own state, for very affordable, go to an institution that has an international perspective. And then also likely as a part of this, we'll also have many international study abroad programs. We'll have international study uh, academic programs. So these are some ways that you can sort of start narrowing your list down if international is a large component uh, uh, of your uh, post-secondary studies for you. So in summary, we covered um, sort of the academic and the clubs, things to think about as far as international student composition and rankings that Aaron just went over. But as these as you think about guiding your college search, we really wanted to make sure that the international component, you knew where to look. So study abroad is most popular, but another part that you may not think about is the internationalizing plans or strategies. Sometimes these are hidden um, in a website, but really it's about the mission and the values that the university is sharing. And this is meant for all students. Um, and so those are some ways to dig, but we hope our, um, presentation made you think a little bit beyond um, study abroad and the traditional sense, but really thinking about internationalizing your college experience. So we'd really like to open it up to some live questions um, and really get your um, answers to you as you, thank you for spending some time with us. All right, Becky, uh, Aaron, thank you so much for that presentation. That was wonderful. Uh, I am sure that everybody is giving you a virtual round of applause right now. You guys did an excellent, excellent job. Um, so I am gonna go over to the Q&A section. And again, um, I'm just pulling questions that have been asked by students. Um, I'm gonna start off with the most commonly asked questions and then we can kind of go into some uh, more nitty gritty if we have, to have some time. Uh, the first question I do wanna ask will be about, uh, you know, the current situation, COVID-19. So. Somebody wrote in and asked, uh, do you envision that student visa applications will be cur curtailed due to COVID? Uh, in particular, US students looking to complete a four-year degree outside of the States. Yeah, I think we're all waiting for guidance from different governments around the world. Currently, um, embassies around the world from a US perspective are closed and slowly opening up. They are prioritizing visa applications. Um, and so we're taking this one country at a time. I know for Santa Clara, we have um, canceled or closed our study abroad for any program that started in August. We have not made a decision for September. So we will support students who are gonna go study abroad in September, and we will work with each program and each visa application that is part of what our study abroad office does um, to make sure that all the information is up to date. But we're also supporting them if they need to switch a program, if they need to um, stay on campus. So it's really case by case, country by country. Um, but we have such knowledgeable staff and faculty. Each university does. There's a, there's a whole organization that supports this. So please know um, that universities are trying to stay as up to date and advocating with both our governments and other countries' governments. So Erin, I don't know if Canada has a different perspective right now with visas? 
I think we're similarly, we're working through the, the process by which uh, health guidelines is dictating uh, some of the process for, I'm sure, in America as well, is, is can be done online. So we are telling students that are abroad that are looking to come to Canada to certainly start that process. Um, and uh, we're, we're making sure that uh, the universities are ready to welcome students when, when, the, when, the, when the province and health guides can, uh, can welcome them. Um, Alex, I, maybe a somewhat related question I happened to see up that pop up was, was taking a gap year. And, and that's uh, for students that are interested, uh, that maybe just want to travel for a year and, mm -hmm. and then come back. And, and that's certainly one way to kind of get that international itch, that travel itch, is travel a year. Um, and so there's a variety of ways that you can do that. There's, uh, many universities will allow students to defer their admission. So apply to that dream school of yours, you get admitted, you still need to accept by May 1 in most cases. And then after that, depending on the institution's process, you can apply to defer for up to a year in many cases, and then you can travel and then they'll hold your spot. Um, so that certainly is a good plan uh, for many students. Um, and if you decide to not apply anywhere, those make sure you're taking a journal with you and you apply, you apply afterwards. Those experiences you have while you're traveling, those can perhaps help you with your, your essay application essays when they when you do this come to apply next year. Absolutely. Uh, thank you, Aaron, for adding on to that, Becky, as well. Thank you so much for, for answering that question. Um, now, another question that I had that kind of uh, leads into just admissions in general in terms of international, a student asks, um, how do admissions to international schools compare to U.S. universities? Hmm. So this is something where it really will depend a little bit country to country. Mm -hmm. uh, Canada is very similar in regards to we're evaluating based on uh, a combination of academics and often uh, essays or some combination of, of uh, holistic review. Other uh, jurisdictions, United Kingdom, um, Europe, they'll have a little bit more emphasis on, on academics. In many cases, the universities are trained to look at your curriculum that you're studying. So if you are an American and you're studying American curriculum, they may require that you submit your SATs or ACTs um, if you're studying IB diploma, they'll be very familiar with that and look at your IB diploma. Um, but the, uh, the timelines generally are, are quite similar at this point. And because international, tr truthfully, attracting students like yourselves, every university wants students that are, that are globally minded. And so we're actually tailoring our admissions to be somewhat similar across countries. Certainly those top universities that you're looking at are going to be pretty familiar with evaluating you. Great. Thank you. And um, just kind of a, a follow up question to, to that for the next step after they all get their international degrees. How do American employers view a degree obtained from an international university? Uh, I can say that uh, we have a lot of our certainly American or students go back to the United States uh, mm -hmm. for graduate studies or for uh, for work. And the fact that uh, most importantly, you have a degree and where that came from, that's, that's somewhat of an interest to an employer, but they're often more, that's just a check mark. And then they're really going to want to hear from you, what your experience has been, how you participate in that club, how you fundraise for that organization. And really the fact that you studied abroad, that's going to set you apart and going to give you a whole lot more answers to those interview questions than perhaps staying home. So that's, that's one perspective. And that's what we're hearing from a lot of our students that, that have uh, go on back home. Absolutely. I would add from a U.S. perspective, we're seeing more and more of our students pursue graduate degrees overseas. Mm -hmm. And one driving force is employability as well as cost, right? It's quite expensive to get an MBA in the U.S. Yeah. Um, but if you get an MBA overseas, you're still sought after. The global economy is English. Um, and so many of these programs and being in Silicon Valley, I can tell you, Look at, look, go on LinkedIn, check out where people get their degrees. They are from all over the world. It's incredible. And that's what makes I can share from Silicon Valley so amazing. Um, Vancouver's like that. Um, many of these hotbeds for really um, entrepreneurial mindset and, and more important now than ever takes the diversity of thought and that comes from global education. Excellent. Thank you both so much. Um, for that response. Just moving on to another question here. Um, would studying abroad mean that it would take longer for me to graduate? Most schools, no. I would say 99% of the time, no. But what's important is proper planning, mm -hmm. guidance, using your resources at a university to plan this out. If you miss a sequence of your graduation requirements, that's going to hold you back. But the universities 
you know, they offer guidance, they offer counseling, they offer advising, there's whole offices that help you, you map this out to include study abroad. If that is a goal, a university will work with you. And um, just to kind of follow up that question, um, add on to it a little bit, uh, can you study abroad in more than one place? That's something that may ex potentially extend your degree a little bit. Uh, this is where this is where we're looking at those universities that have pretty expansive uh, international programs mm -hmm. uh, would would be with a lot more options. Uh, it's it's not common, but uh, I do know of a student. We have a student or student ambassador who uh, studied abroad for a term and then they did actually work learn. So we haven't talked a lot about uh, uh, actual um, volunteer options, but they did a volunteer option. Um, I think that student also did a work option as well. So there's there's a variety of ways that you can do that. And, and it may not be study abroad, but it may actually be working abroad. Uh, certainly UBC, our, our, our internship or co-op program uh, has three placements and, and students will often do two of those in different countries. So that might be another way for you to really travel the world. There is also this very popular program that has partnerships at a lot of universities called Semester at Sea, where you the, hem the southern hemisphere for your semester and you stop in different ports in different countries. So again, if that is your goal to see as many countries as possible, then start asking those questions because there is probably a program or a university that can make that happen. Thank you both. Um, just moving on and this question is in particular study abroad, but I am going to bring it to international studies overall. Uh, will the course material uh, be in the language of the country you're studying in or, um, or will it be in the language that, you know, from the US in this case, uh, in English? Usually it is the uh, country, is in, typically it's in English. If you're looking at our universities, it's often the university and because it's, it's exchange, uh, typically a student from that university comes to the uh, partner university, comes, comes home, trades spaces with you, if you will, true exchange. And so that's a nice, often a relief that you don't have to speak French and you can still study in France. There's many universities that have, uh, if not all English, they have English streams that you would study in. Excellent. Um, moving on, on to questions regarding finance. Um, if you're from the, U the USA and you go to college in a different country, can you still file for financial aid, things like FAFSA? I believe so. Um, there are certain uh, relationships with certain universities. I know there's a couple in the UK that might accept it, but typically it tends to be the loan the loans that carry over that you can apply, it, it, they may not offer financial aid in the same way a US school with using their own funds. Remember, as Karen said, a lot of foreign universities are run by governments and have that government oversight. And so they're there to educate their citizens. Whereas in the US, you have this model of private and public. So a public school is there to educate its in-state students, but a private school fundraises. And those funds can be distributed to any student they wish, right, to offset the cost. And that might be part of a financial aid package. And a lot of other countries, that isn't the case. The private fundraising isn't happening. And so, but you may be able to take your loans that the U.S. government can offer towards an education overseas. Um, so that would be a case by case. And those universities usually have that outlined um, for an international student mm -hmm. Be, as an American studying abroad, um, that you could ask them and, and seek that out. And uh, Becky, just to follow up with that, because um, you mentioned uh, pri the private division. So uh, are there scholarships for students to study abroad? Are there things like that available to them? Yeah, absolutely. Um, at universities in the U.S., as you think about studying abroad, they may have scholarships internally that the university encourages, but there's also outside organizations that they'll expose you Fulbright, there's these large foundations that are trying to expose students and don't want cost to be an access, a barrier. So if you're interested and you're excited, that should be an early conversation with your study abroad advisor or your academic advisor to see how they can make that happen. Let's jump in is a little bit more in terms of, thanks Becky, in terms of the Canadian perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, most Canadian universities that, that people on this call will be looking at do accept FAFSA the loans, as Becky noted. So your, your Pell Grants, uh, those would not be transferable, but the, the student loans or the loans to parents mm -hmm. will be transferable. Um, and then universities in Canada, a lot of them do offer limited scholarships. So as, as we are public institutions, as been noted, uh, the majority of funding does go to Canadians. 
But in, in the case of UBC, we actually spend close to $25 million on uh, uh, awards and other student work learning programs for international students. And so about what that works out to for UBC is about one fifth of our admitted students will receive a, a scholarship ranging from about ten to $25,000. All right, thank you both so much for that response. Um, now, uh, I had a question here that was regarding a specific area of uh, the UK, but I'm kind of going to generalize it. Um, this person asked to study at St. Andrews in the UK, how would it change my daily life? And so I'm going to kind of change that question a little bit. How does study abroad and, and international studies in general change, you know, a student's daily life? And this is one where um, it's, it's, it's much like your, the, the, the question, if I'm living in San Francisco, what is life going to be like in, in Boston? Mm -hmm. um, and so this is where our jobs between Becky and myself, there's counterparts in pretty much every university around the world. Certainly St. Andrews, I know. I actually know uh, what's, um, her name's escaping me, but I can picture her face right now. Um, and so we are happy to share those experiences. So start with on our website um, and look for this, the campus tour, just as you would be exploring U.S. institutions. Um, certainly with this day and age, we're living in now, we're probably all offering Zoom webinars mm -hmm. at every hour of the day for students. And, uh, but, but it is gonna be a little bit different in, the, in the Europe um, and pretty much outside of North America, that college campus lifestyle, as I mentioned earlier, it is gonna be a, di a little bit different, not the same residential life, maybe not the same extension of, of athletics and 30,000 people going to a football game. Um, but there's are so many benefits and visiting the website, talking to one of our representatives, uh, these are sorts of experiences that, that we really would be excited to do. All right. Thank you both so much. Uh, you guys are knocking all these questions out of the park. Um, so as I'm looking through here and just looking for some additional ones, um, are they, do, do you, can you two provide some good resources for finding international study programs and, and study abroad programs? Um, I, that, that question seems to be coming up a lot, just looking for other resources in order to, to research this kind of stuff. Yeah, Aaron and I actually started to dive in to find this and we sort of had a roadblock. So there's not a perfect place to look, which is maybe out of this, we're gonna learn, we need to put something together. Um, but one place to start um, is definitely study in. So you saw Aaron's slide, study in the UK, study in Netherlands, study in Canada, study in Singapore. They tend to have these official sites that, that sort of complement. And for US, we have Education USA, right? It's run out of the State Department. And so they're promoting higher education as a country. That might be the best place to start. Um, you may also want to, um, as you dive into programs like the Big Futures, um, anything with um, Mitch or, or Google, is think about the words you're using and typing in, right? As I shared, you know, you type in business, you just add the word international, something may come up. Um, so that would be the other trick to this is really think about all the different categories because there is not one great place to look for this. I don't know if Aaron has other thoughts. Yeah, just that larger, larger view on this would also just be that the, we're really glad that study abroad is an international aspect or like a top of many of your minds. But really, it is just one aspect. And I, and I think that uh, remembering that you will be there for four years, and even if you do one or two years of the years, years abroad, I'm speaking if you're saying you're staying in the United States, um, mm -hmm. then you certainly you want to be thinking about those other aspects that probably other webinars uh, as part of this fantastic Navigate uh, conference is hosting. Things like you want to be at a big university, a small university, close to the ocean or a lake in a city or a town. So narrow your, narrow your universities, get your, get your list down to a 20 or something like that. And then once you have those 10, 15 universities, that's when you may need to do a little more research and, and look at some of those aspects that we've talked about in terms of what's the international student population, the, the study abroad program website. Um, and so that's when those things can, can sort of layer on top of the larger experience because you will be there for four years and you wanna make sure that you're in a city that you like, that you're in a climate that you like. Um, and once all that's check, 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 then you can then put that on top and What's the best study abroad program of these 10 universities that, are, that I really like? Most universities, when you go onto their website, when you start exploring, you don't need to stop at the admission page. Do dive in like you're a current student. So the study abroad page, you might yeah. 
might end up finding yourself too. And many of them will have a feature where you, for students, current students that you can use. I want to go to this country. I'm going to be this major. What's available? How much does it cost? What are the academic courses that transfer? Right? And so you can start behaving like a current student on our website to dive into all the resources. You please, please, please don't stop at the admission page. Um, we're just we're just one part of a university, but the best place to start to go is dive in. Some of us on our websites might even have international as a header right on the home page and then you can start diving in and exploring in that way and then do reach out ask questions and many of us in admissions we serve as an introduction we'll introduce you to study abroad or we'll introduce you to the international programs head um, so you can start asking your questions i'll just add as well that the i see a couple questions in terms of programs mm -hmm. um study abroad in most institutions is across all across all academic programs uh, so again, that academic program should be probably high up there alongside city size and all those sorts of things. And yeah. just take for granted that uh, or assume that the study abroad that is at the university will apply to the program that you're interested in. Um, that is when it comes further down the line, that can be a part of the way that you pick a university within a country you want to go to. Because if you are interested in studying biology and you're interested in studying France, then not all French universities might have the best biology program. So that's another way, but that's something you won't worry about until you get to the university in second right. year. Um, so that's at this point, focus on the, the, the broader topics and assume that programs will be offered in study abroad. Okay. And yeah, so, in, you know, Aaron, just as you said, um, there are questions coming in regarding, you know, what are the most common majors for students studying abroad? You know, are there any particular ones that they should be looking for if this is something that they really are interested in? We see everything. Our engineers go abroad, our theater majors, our undecided students who are still exploring. Um, so yeah, there isn't really one. I would say any of our international business, international affairs, it's actually a requirement to graduate that they have to have time. Any of our language programs, if you're going to be a major in a language, you have to go to a country where that's the language. You usually have higher expectations that all your courses are in that language so that you can graduate being proficient. So I, it's not about popularity, which program. It's really, as Erin said, interest. We're going to say yes. Um, it's about then finding the perfect study abroad program for your interest in your academic and your career. Excellent. Awesome. Um, just to add in another question here, uh, and once again, you guys are firing these off. You guys do an excellent job handling all these questions. Um, uh, you had touched on earlier some clubs that may assist in, in study abroad programs. So someone specifically asked, are there other, um, you know, Model UN type of clubs that, that give study abroad programs or, or, you know, allow you to go abroad? Um, a lot of people seem to be asking, you know, what type of clubs and things are available to, to do that. Yeah, we have um, Engineers Without Borders. They go all over the place. Um, there's also the Medical Brigade. I think it's a national organization as well for pre-med public health kind of students who, again, want to do service work. Um, as a Jesuit university, we have the Jesuit Volunteer Corps. And again, going out and giving service um, is part of that, that plan. So absolutely, there's, there's national organizations as well as more individual university. Mm -hmm. so there's any Canadian national organizations? Uh, I mean, I think that the, looking at universities that, that uh, um, sorry, I was tracking some of the questions. I missed a little bit what you just said, Becky. Um, <laughs> but I was... See, listening, you're listening and, and doing these. Um, but I, I was going to say, kind of come back to an earlier point I was talking about is one way you, one way you can and start with is looking at that. I, I showed the list of the universities that have higher international student populations. Chances are, if a university has a high international student population, it will also have a larger number of international clubs. Um, and so, whether those are clubs that are just on on different languages or culture, or they're actually clubs where you're studying abroad. Um, that's if you're if you're really starting your search, you're not where where to even sure where to begin. Um, Google, you know, North American or American universities with interna large international population or top twenty international populations, um, and you can you can come across those lists, and that can be a way to start to start your search a little bit. Awesome. All right, thank you guys uh, so much. I, actually, also sorry, I also had a couple yeah. questions in terms of high school. Um, yeah. I think earlier as well in terms of how to how to how to. Uh, um, 
so yeah, so in terms of high school, that that, that the whether you study abroad in high school or you're part of Model United Nations or high school, those mm -hmm. are things certainly that uh, can help your application. Um, at UBC, we talk a little a lot about how you reflect on this. And now we're kind of getting off topic in terms of how to prepare for a good application, but just doing a, a checklist. All right, I studied abroad and then I was in you know, the United Nation. Most admissions now are, are not as interested in just a, a running list of activities and I've you know, built a house in uh, Venezuela or something. They want to see how that has changed you, how you reflected on that. Um, and I'm sure Becky would probably nod and, and agree on those sorts of activities. So don't do them just do them enjoy them, but also what did you learn from those experiences when you're studying abroad and doing abroad uh, activities in, international, in high school? Yeah, and then the other thing to keep in mind is um, know that the universities you're applying to, if you've moved around a lot, maybe you had an international move or you did do that um, semester city year abroad um, in Beijing and you have credits for high school from that, just know the admission office knows what to do with that, especially if we have international students. Aaron and I, we're proficient in understanding curriculums around the world. We know how to convert it to a GPA that we need. Um, just know that that is not unusual in our applicant pool and we, we love it, we love seeing it, but it also for a student who doesn't have that, it's, it's no harm, um, but just know as documents come in or, or time away or you moved, we're very comfortable with navigating those stories of your academic transcript. Um, and uh, Alex, if I can jump in, I, I, yeah, I uh, want to also make sure that uh, we are recognizing there's folks here that probably are in community colleges as well. And yes, I was just that, about to ask um, about that. That uh, community colleges, specifically in terms of community colleges applying to universities outside of North America, that that where that is where you will probably want to do some more individual research. There, I mentioned earlier that universities really want to welcome all of you on this call. Um, to be truthful, I, I'm not as not as familiar with how Europe and UK institutions have as much experience with looking at community college. I want to say that, like in Canada, we are quite familiar with that. But it is something that's that's worth doing a little a uh, little more research and getting in touch with the university itself. Um, things like transfer credits that may come as a bit of a, not be as, as, as seamless, certainly, uh, as it would be in, in the US. Um, likely in US, you could already see exactly what kind of transfer credit you're gonna get and what level you're gonna go into. You will not be able to reassuredly get that same level of transparency when you're applying to university with a, from the community college. Um, I will say at UBC, we, well, we do welcome, we receive many, many community college applications. Um, but it is something that, uh, depending on how many years you've done and what you're hoping to transfer into, it may be as much, only as little as one year or coming into second year. So that's just something to do a little more research on. Awesome. All right. Um, well, we are uh, running short on time here. Um, once again, uh, Becky and Aaron, thank you guys so much for, for taking the time out of your schedule to, to jump on this and, and really talk about this topic. Um, I'm sure everyone in the audience really appreciates it. And once again, they're, they're definitely giving you a round of applause right now. You two did an excellent job. Um, just a, a couple of quick things for everybody. Um, this does conclude our presentation uh, on international study options in a post COVID-19 future. Um, remember you can return to this uh, recording uh, tomorrow as it will be posted then along with every other recording from every other session will also be available on the Navigate 2020 site. So if you have any, uh, if you want to return to any of the sessions, you will be able to starting tomorrow. Um, I want to thank once again, our panelists, Becky and Aaron, and um, this was a wonderful, wonderful session and I'm sure everybody appreciates it. Um, and for everyone out there, you know, remember to explore your college options in a virtual college fairs as they are still currently open right this minute. We have hundreds of interactive virtual booths where you can watch videos, download material, even chat with admissions representatives. Uh, we also have some booths that had scheduled live events, so keep your eyes out to see if there's still some available. Uh, well, that well, does come say hello to us at our UBC and Santa Clara booths. So if you didn't get a chance Absolutely. to ask your question, those answer those questions at the UBC or Santa Clara booth, then uh, we'd love to see you. So yep. thanks, guys. Be kind, be calm, be safe. Thank you all so much. Have a nice day.